All right, we are live from the Salem Bike Summit. Rep Tucker, you almost ready? All right, everyone, can I please have your attention? Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're gonna get started pretty much now. Um, all right, this is great, thank you so much. Um, I realize some folks are still coming in. Um, again, feel free to, at any point, grab the rest of breakfast, but I do wanna get going because Rep Tucker has to run, uh, he's gotta vote at 11. So let's make sure that that gets taken care of. Um, welcome to the Bike Summit, we have a full day. Uh, we're gonna jump in quickly to opening remarks um, just by Paul here. He's an excellent ally on the advocacy field, on the policy side of things, and the cultural side of things. A little bit of history. Um, you were sheriff for when? Uh, police chief. Sorry, police chief, my apologies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I would've liked to have been sheriff if yeah. I came with a horse. But <laughs> I was the police chief. Yeah, so. Excellent. Um, and then um, from elected office, you are now sitting on the Joint Transportation Committee. I am. And so hopefully you can speak a little bit towards that. But sure. um, Rep Tucker here is a yep. friend and ally, and I'll, I'll kind of start off with them, and then we'll jump right in. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And um, not only am I happy to be here, but I'm happy to see so many people from Salem to greet you, but to greet folks who have come from Gloucester and North Andover, Cambridge. So we're a very old city. We're almost 400 years old. We're the third oldest um, in the Commonwealth. We're coming up on our 400th. What does that mean for today? Our roads, are, some of them are 400 years old. And as you can imagine what the challenges are with the infrastructure that we have. So it's already made my day when I saw a bike come in with a lawnmower behind him, this gentleman. That's already made my day. I'm taking, I took a picture of it. It'll be on my Twitter feed later on when I leave here. That's just awesome. So um, I had the pleasure of, of meeting with Galen through uh, my friend Eric Papetti from Salem, who uh, does incredible work along with the other members of the, of the bike committee. So a few things from my background and a few things of what I'm doing now. So I was on the police department here for 32 years, and unfortunately, when it came to bicycle safety, I always found that in law enforcement, and I think unfortunately still to some effect, we're more reactive than proactive. Um, we fix things after they've broken. It hasn't been that really that, that much forward thinking. So when I met with Galen, when I started to meet with many folks from the, from the biking community, and now as a member of the transportation committee, to me, that's helping to educate me. So the three E's for, for me as a police officer when it came to road safety was education, enforcement, and engineering. And I know that I saw them somewhere behind, it, and we borrowed three of those in, in law enforcement. And we always prided ourselves on doing a pretty good job. So part of what I view my job now is, particularly as a state rep serving on the Transportation Committee, is one, coming out and helping to educate the public, and two, being proactive to make sure that we, we make our streets as safe as can be. Um, I've also learned a lot. I looked at the mission statement of, of, um, of Mass Bike. You know, the fun part is always going to be there. The transportation piece, I think, is... is um, something that we need to talk more about. I know in Salem we're looking at various ways of, of moving folks with public transportation. Um, unfortunately, in this era of social media in real time, I got one this morning, Mr. Tucker, the train is broken down in Saugus, what are you gonna do about it today? Um, probably not a lot today, but it's something that we need to look forward to. And my message, part of my message today is to incorporate and integrate bike safety into all the things we're doing. I know that we talk about complete streets. I've looked on the website of liberal streets. I've met the folks uh, from Cambridge. There is, I think, some great momentum to get some good things done. And it happens in places just like this. And I think that's part of the reason why we're here today. So my second message today is to let you know that at the State House, we hear you. So in anticipation of coming this morning, I, I pulled up all of the bills that have something to do with either bike safety or transportation. There are actually 38 pending bills right now at the State House that touch everything that you're doing in one way or another. And I took just a bit of a sampling of each because I know we were pressed at time. The first one, I think the most significant thing we're doing is we're about to pass a hands-free bill. Um, we are way, way overdue. I can tell you that um, I'm in my fifth year now at the State House, and probably the most uh, difficult testimony to hear, the most heart-wrenching first-person accounts was from parents who have lost children who were biking, and they were hit by somebody, a distracted driver. 
So I can tell you now that the House has passed overwhelmingly, 155 to 2, I think, was the vote. We passed the House version. The Senate has, over the last couple of terms, they've passed their version. They've done it again. We're getting very close, um, not to get too deep in the weeds on legislative process, but the bills were a little different, so it's gone to what's called conference committee. And there's three, de three uh, House members, three senators, they're getting very close. The safety piece, we all agree on. The last part right now is how we collect data. There have been some concerns that were raised about the potential of racial profiling. We want to make sure that we get a good, clean bill to the governor's desk. We also want to make sure that we send a message to law enforcement, that we send a message across that this is for enforcement purposes for those who violate the law, period. So I think we're getting very close on that. We brought the police chiefs in. Um, a lot of my former colleagues have been able to weigh in. So I'm very optimistic that uh, before we take our, our shutdown in August, that we'll have something out. It's long overdue. I'm very, very confident we're going to get it done. I also have a bit of a sampling of some other bills, and some, frankly, that I hadn't even seen yet. Um, there's a bill that would encourage DPH to do an education program to encourage uh, waste up high visibility clothing, something I hadn't thought of before. I see a lot of bikers now that have the traffic vests on, and I can tell you as somebody that worked hundreds of jobs out on the road and at traffic scenes, there's nothing replacing that high visibility clothing. I think that that's a great idea. I found another bill that I found very interesting, and it has to do with what we call vulnerable users of the roads, pedestrians, bikes, skateboarders, roller skaters, and what this would call for is a three-foot pass-by at 30 miles an hour, and for every 10 miles an hour up, you add another foot. We need to protect folks out there. We know we've got the bike lanes, we know we've got the striping and the painting. Again, this is part of the education piece. Now, one of the things that, that I have been supportive of that ran into a roadblock the last couple of sessions is the lateral protective devices. So you'll see on trucks oftentimes there's a lot of room underneath, and unfortunately sometimes people have been struck, badly injured, or killed going underneath the truck. Um, this has met some heavy resistance. We want to make sure we put some type of a guard between the front and back wheels. As you can imagine, there's some resistance from the trucking companies. There's some resistance from the trucking manufacturers. Now, let me just give you a 30-second commercial on legislation. We get about 7,000 bills a year that are filed. We will pass about 400. Now, it's not that those other 6,600 bills are bad bills. Oftentimes, they're not. In fact, it could be great bills. But there's only so much bandwidth, and there's only so much momentum that we can get going. The second part of that is, it's easier to kill legislation than to pass it. And I know sometimes folks in the biking community have talked to me, bills have come third, fourth time in sessions. Why can't we get this done? There is a, a maturing process where people have to look at the legislation, they've got to be able to buy into it. These, these side lateral protections, it's going to be a bit of a, of a lift because we've, we've got to get the manufacturers on board, we've got to get the trucking industry on board. And I think that if we make the case, we can, we can start to get that done. Um, there are a number of bills pertaining to um, scooters, bikes, the, um, the e-bikes. I know that there's been um, a movement in the city, and I know some of, the, some of our, our bike folks here in Salem know that over the last couple of weeks in the city council, they've, they've had some debate about the, uh, the scooters. We had a hearing at the state house about whether we should mandate helmets, what we should do about signal and, and lighting. All of that, is, it's a bit of a fluid situation, it's still in play. Um, to me, the biggest message here out of, out of my three E's is education. We've got to educate the public. Case in point is the distracted driving. Um, we're, going to, we're, we're carving out a chunk of time after we pass this bill that we're going to hand out warnings, whether it's a three month or six month window, to educate the public. We've got people that have been engaging in bad behavior driving for a long time. It's going to take a lot to turn that around. We can't just magically pass a bill, wave the wand, and then expect that people are going to put their phones down. There has to be a piece to it. It's the education. When the education phase is done, we will move to the enforcement. And if you look at the, the fines, the graduated fines from 100 to 250 to 500, the only piece that we didn't put in was an insurance surcharge. There was some opposition to that. 
We wanted a bill that was passed overwhelmingly. We want to make a statement so there will not be an insurance surcharge if you are given a violation. So my message today to leave you is be advocates. Uh, Galen's at the State House quite a bit. He's in touch with all of us, a great advocate. I hear from the folks from Salem. This is what we need to keep doing. And I, I say this, we look at a lot of things that we need to change in society. You can't be a bystander. You can't, you can't just see things and we all kind of grumble and complain privately, but we really don't do much about it. It's grassroots efforts like this. It's the advocacy groups, particularly Mass Bike, a statewide organization that has a seat at the table and has a strong voice. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from the people that are affected. It's easy for us. Sometimes they call the State House the bubble. We're in the bubble. We don't know what's going on outside. We need folks like you to pierce the bubble and let us know firsthand. So thank you for the opportunity to come this morning. Welcome to a great city. If you have a chance, for those of you that, that have your bikes and you're not from Salem, lots of great, great things to see. Every time I talk to a group that's not from Salem, I have to give the tourism pitch too. And um, if you do come in October, be prepared to walk your bike a lot. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, and thanks for, for being here today. Thanks, Paul. Thank now, Paul's got to run because he actually has a vote at 11, so I'm going to let you go. But if there are any follow-up questions, he is a public servant, so I'll share your email if that's okay. Yeah. Um, he's entirely reachable, very friendly guy, and you can always schedule a meeting with him um, or his staff at the State House too. Um, I think it was really nice to start off with kind of the high-level conversation about what goes on legislatively, what uh, the sense of bike advocacy, transportation safety, um, we didn't really talk too much about public health, it was more of a transportation side right there, but I think that starting from the top, and then we'll kind of work our way down to the grassroots throughout the day. Um, I want to take a pause just to remind us that we are here, not just through Mass Bike, but with the Department of Public Health through the Mass in Motion program, um, and Dave Watson through Watson Active. This is a partnership that we're doing right here. Um, I would love to see maybe a show of hands of the Mass in Motion uh, representatives and coordinators who are in the room. So cool. so everybody look around if you have any questions about what Mass in Motion is, and um, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything about the program real fast. Yes, David, too. Yeah. Kim, do you want to jump in real quick? I'm not to throw you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I'm glad to have you here. Um, David, do you want to mention a little bit about what you're doing with Watson Active? Yeah, so uh, as part of the technical assistance and mass in motion in general, we focus on changes to policy systems and the built environment, as Kim mentioned. And so I hope as the discussions go on today that it sparks some ideas among our mass in motion people about uh, things you might do back in your communities. Uh, and if you need technical assistance, uh, in implementing any of the, those ideas, uh, please do get in touch with me or one of the other technical assistance providers. And uh, I also wanted to say it's good to see some familiar faces in the audience. And uh, I also hope to have some good conversation with uh, people I haven't met yet today. So welcome. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks for the support. Um, and we have David's cards at the front, too, if you want to check out Watson Active, um, as well as mine, too. So we encourage you to keep in touch. and. We're a resource for you um, from the advocacy side of things, from the technical assistance side of things, or even just if you want to go for a bike ride, um, just give us a call. So um, the way that we've structured the agenda, which has been a little bit malleable and flexible since even yesterday, so bear with us, <laughs> um, but we're kind of starting with complete streets as the little bit deeper than just the introduction, but a little bit more about the concept and how complete streets functions. Um, then we're going to go a little bit into the network, the planning, the evaluation, how we are actually looking at the regional, or the local and regional sinews, because um, we know that bike lanes don't exist in a vacuum, um, and you can't just magically appear on a bike path, you have to get there. 
So the idea of connectivity. Um, then we'll take a break for lunch and we'll introduce the bicycle mower. And thanks Chris for showing up with the bike mower again. It's a neat little topic there. Um, and then we'll jump into the end in the afternoon with a conversation about education, community advocacy, and Yesterday was the first of these summits. We have three of them. We were in Worcester yesterday, and tomorrow we'll be in Springfield. Yesterday was a similar style in terms of topics, different presenters, different regional issues that we were covering. But at the end of the day, we kind of had a roundtable conversation about advocacy, about um, specifically about how to reach folks who weren't represented in the room. And that could be um, a racial question, that could be uh, an age question, that could be an economic status question, but how do we broaden our reach? And it's hard for us to kind of get outside of our bubbles and have that conversation, but I kind of want to plant these seeds now. So throughout the day, I want you to think about the two posters that we've put up on the wall. Um, one of them is the racial justice reframing questions, which I've been introduced to through the Mass in Motion program. It's basically what I think of how to approach the big E of equity. How do we try to reach as many people as possible and know that arguably bike advocacy is a very white conversation. In the past, it's been a very male-dominated conversation. We're seeing a little bit more balance and parity of gender, but we're not really seeing the turnout, the um, participation in um, kind of the, the racial equality side. So that's something to think about throughout the day. Um, it's hard for us to break outside of our bubbles, but just put that in your back pocket and we can try to come up with um, some brainstorms at the end. And then the five E's of bike advocacy which are education, engineering, evaluation, encouragement, and enforcement. Some people add equity as a sixth E, but we like to think of equity as kind of an overarching lens. We don't want to separate it out as an independent topic. So think about these, the education, the engineering, the evaluation, the encouragement, and the enforcement. Um, we have different presenters who are experts on each of these topics, or a few of these topics. Um, we'll be covering safe routes to schools with the education. We have um, the DOT here talking about complete streets and the city of Salem here talking about the engineering side of things. We have folks in the MTA to talk about the evaluation and how we're actually assessing what we're doing. Um, the encouragement, of course, is just going out and riding. Um, not just that, but kind of, you know, we are here as resources um, to break down barriers for folks and encourage everybody to ride, all people. Again, thinking of who benefits. We want as many people as possible. Um, and then uh, we aren't really going to touch too much on enforcement. Um, Rep. Tucker might have mentioned it a little bit in his days as police chief here in Salem, um, but just know that enforcement is necessary in order to have effective bike advocacy. Um, I don't want to go too much more into it besides just to lay these out, but I do want to open up the field if anybody has any initial thoughts that they want to plant some seeds in at the beginning of today just so we can carry it through. And I know it's Hard to be put on the spot if you weren't expecting it, but are there any any thoughts that are on the tip of your tongue? And it's okay if not. Okay, um, maybe we'll just jump right into the topics. I don't know if I could ask Michelle um, and Nick if you want to just come up and yeah, Chris, please. So um, just thinking outside the box a little bit, I'd say climate change is a concern uh, for most people, and if there's ways to bring in uh, Reducing your use of gas, or, or ideally ways to create um, carbon offsets. So if you're replacing an activity that you used to use gas and now you're not, um, that should be a carbon offset that an airplane company could buy and be um, have a have a smaller carbon footprint that way. Um, one tool to do that um, is actually a phone app called Charity Miles. And this uses other people's money to donate to a charity of your choice uh, from a list of about 20 or so. Um, so just look up Charity Miles. Um, for me, I chose the Nature Conservancy. And when I rode my bicycle this morning to get a gallon of milk, um, eight miles, uh, the Nature Conservancy got a little bit of money from a corporate sponsor. It turned out to be a hedge fund manufacturer. Um, so Every little bit helps, and uh, I'd say if we can focus a little bit on how to offset greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. uh, that's an interest. Great. Maybe another E could be like environmental. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I can build on that, I commuted to work for 35 years by bike, and I did the math. So something like 350,000 uh, pounds of carbon on offset, and nobody got the benefit of that, that I guess. Maybe we all did. It's, it's phenomenal. It doesn't take much. Cool.
Cool, thank you. And in an advocacy standpoint, just to build off of the climate change issue, um, we hear from the governor that the two biggest issues that he's facing in terms of transportation are congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. And a study came out last year that said the transportation sector is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas in the state of Massachusetts. And I think I heard a statistic yesterday that 70% of that can be um, automobile traffic. So what can we do to minimize, I mean, every little bit helps. We're not trying to find a magic bullet and the one issue here, but that's certainly good to keep in mind. So thank you, Chris, for framing that. Okay. Um, may I introduce you? Sure. All right, Michelle's here from the Complete Streets. Perfect. Um, program at MassDOT. Uh, Michelle Lunella is um, one of our awesome allies um, at HQ. Um, she is incredibly knowledgeable. She works on a small but robust team that definitely punches above their weight. Um, and we're featuring them in all three of our um, summits around the state because the statewide work that goes on with Complete Streets is impressive but also immense. So um, I will just kind of let you take it away. Actually, before I go, is there a show of hands? Anybody unfamiliar with the concept of Complete Streets? And that's okay because we can do a quick 90 second. Okay, great. So Peter, so yeah, we'll, we'll jump through a little of that. How many of you are part of Complete Streets communities that you know have already passed Complete Streets policies? And how many of you, excellent, that's impressive, right? Um, how many of you are looking to become Complete Streets communities? All right, cool. Great. And on that, I'll kind of Cover all that. Yeah. Um, all right, so, as, thank you, Gail. As um, Galen said, um, I'm Michelle Danilla. I'm the Complete Streets Engineer at MassDOT. Um, I'm situated in Boston at our headquarters. Um, MassDOT is also divided by six districts. Um, so Courtney, and I said Dwyer, Courtney just got married. <laughs> had a very informal um, presentation, so feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, so I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, what transportation, what complete streets is, um, and it's very different than what it has been in the past. Um, so we at the DOT frame it as transportation. We want, we're in the business of giving people transportation options. We're not telling you if you want to go somewhere, you have to drive a car, you have to walk, you have to bike. We provide all the options and therefore you can make those decisions on your own. Um, and so we look at giving people more access across the Commonwealth um, through what we fund, you know, how we invest in our infrastructure and also the services that we provide. And so the secretary um, at uh, DOT often says it's it's not about what transportation is. I'm sorry, I'm gonna see if I can get this mic to work. Uh -huh. oh. Sorry to interrupt. I don't think anyone told me they couldn't hear the mic. Is, there, is it hard to hear in the back? Sorry to interrupt. That's right. It's better if people can hear you. Can Try that. Ah. Success. All right. I'm also short. So. I wouldn't blame the height. <laughs> blame the well, mic. It's the <laughs> yeah. I can't get the mic. All right. Is that better? All right. Um, so anyway, what I was saying was that we are in the business of giving people option um, and how you get around is your decision. But we like to think of um, you know if you want to walk, bike transit, drive a car, take the commuter rail, bus, um, all sorts of options, use the scooter. Um, and so the secretary at MassDOT often says that transportation is not what it is, the roads, the um, planes, the automobiles, um, but, it's, but it's more about what it does. It, it gets people from where they want to go, connects people to people and places and destinations and opportunities um, to jobs, etc. Um, and so we focus on making sure that we can get people around um, regardless of your age, your ability, um, and also regardless of weather, because uh, we have a little, little bit of everything here. And also transportation isn't what it used to be. Um, there's been a lot of innovations in transportation, um, especially about um, just infrastructure and how we treat our roads and uh, the space with our public right-of-ways, but it's also about mobility services. There's a lot more mobility services out there today than there has been in the past. And so I'm gonna kind of give an update on what we're doing at the state to kind of um, address some of those changes. So back in, I wanna say 2017, 2016, um, there was a group that was established to kind of look at what we do and how we do 
um, our work at MassDOT and try to think more around complete streets. Um, I wasn't at the DOT at the time, but they came up with kind of this long list to think about our processes and our processes and our projects. Um, and so we've implemented a lot of this stuff um, to date. <coughs> But one, one example is just like standardizing how we do our complete streets reviews. Um, we have everyone in the district review every project for thinking about ped, bike, um, and transit. And so making sure that we're all on the same page, we're all commenting on the same thing, um, we're all thinking about and looking for those key elements to get people out of their cars and to walk and bike. Uh, the other big thing is we, a lot of times didn't see projects until they were at 25%, and there's a lot that happens from zero to 25%. That's when your cross sections are established, that's when um, you know, you're thinking about, are you providing for people biking, what are you doing for walking, is there transit? And, and we weren't, the DOT wasn't in the room during those, so we've initiated and implemented some pre-25 techniques to make sure that we are in the room and we are making sure that we're challenging the consultants and the designers and the communities to really think about people walking, biking, and taking transit from the very start of their project. Um, so one thing is that we published our design guidance back in 2006, um, and as I said, a lot has changed since then. There's also a lot of new resources that are out there today that kind of tackle and, and um, present some of these best practices, especially our separated bike lane um, planning and design guide. Um, has anyone used it? Know it exists? <laughs> a few people. Um, it's a great short resource um, that provides um, design details and kind of planning around separated bike lanes. But also just designing in general has changed. Um, you know, it used to be the focus of the automobile and now it's the focus of people um, and how do we get people to and from where they're going and also thinking about it not as a crash, crashes are significant and we should definitely factor those into our projects, but also be proactive and think about just how people feel on, on the roads that they're traveling, especially if you're on a bike. We know there's been a lot of research, we know that not everyone is gonna bike in a shoulder. Um, there's a lot of people that want more separation or if you wanna bike with your kids um, or your grandparents, your elderly parents, anyone, they, there's, everyone has different criteria and where they perceive and feel safe. Um, and so thinking about comfort when it comes around biking and not just safety. Um, also, we know that you know transit users is something that we weren't uh, designing for before, that we have started in the last few years. Um, and then also on the bottom here is just kind of what we, we like to show as this is what, the way we think about it. This is kind of out of our separated bike lane um, planning and design guide. You have you know, your family friendly, um, you know, not so confident riders, um, all the way to the left here, and then you have the more confident riders all the way to the right, and it kind of shows you what facilities people would feel comfortable riding and where. And so this is really where our design um, and our design guidance is headed. Um, there isn't just a one. There isn't just a one solution for all. Um, back in 2014, we initiated or we um, put out an engineering directive that said all roads have to have five foot shoulders. And what we did was. We basically said, if you want to ride a bike, we will provide five feet on any road, regardless of the speed, the volume, the characteristics, um, anything on that road. And what it did was it really, it, a lot of people don't feel comfortable riding in a bike <coughs> shoulder. That is not in the United States. <laughs> Try to give the example that is not our own. Um, but there is a lot of cases where we provide five foot shoulders and no one ever bikes in them because they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe. So we're currently um, about to release a new engineering directive that kind of goes back to our context sensitive solutions. And thinking about, okay, if we have a uh, you know, narrow road, let's think about a different facility. If we have a high speed road, let's put a shared use path along the side um, and really think about how we can provide bike facilities that people will use and that we're <coughs> trying to get, the, that, that are available for the highest percentage of the population to, to feel comfortable and ride in. And that's really how we'll make that shift in mode split. So one thing is that because everything is changing <laughs> on a daily basis, I think we joke, um, you know, we're constantly training our own staff and making sure that everyone's aware of the latest best practices, what other states and what other communities are doing. And so we do um, do uh, a lot of trainings uh, with our own staff. And so this was we did um, a year ago a kind of a two-hour training for all of our district staff 
and our headquarters staff that was really about why we care about people biking. Um, that wasn't the title, but <laughs> you know, it was more like they're they're a valid user. They're a part of our roads. It's not our our job to decide again how people move. We want to make sure that we are providing for people biking, and it was a very high level training. And then in the fall and again in the spring, we did um, an all day focused design training. Um, for our design staff so they can really get, we did a lot of case studies, a lot of design exercises that starts to think about how you can apply these, you know, going back to that, all those types of bike facilities, when, when's the best selection um, for which bike facility you should use. So that was kind of a big what we're doing at MassDOT. I'm going to kind of dive into two key elements um, and first is the statewide bike plan. Um, so we initiated a statewide bike plan update to our statewide bike plan back in 2016. Um, it's due to be final in the next few months. Uh, it's coming out soon. Um, there's a draft version on the website. And also as part of that, we did companion documents for both. We did a pedestrian plan as well, um, but they are two separate plans. We did a municipal <coughs> resource guide for walkability and a municipal resource guide for bikeability. Um, and those are really good, like 50 page guidebooks that provide kind of the details and the hyperlinks for communities if they're starting to get into complete streets and especially biking. So there was a big robust um, uh, aspect of this plan. There was public involvement, there was a steering committee. Um, there was also, you know, reviewing and thinking about best practices and also looking ahead, what, what's not out there yet. Um, and then also a big component of data, which I'll get into. So. As part of the um, plan, we did a lot of listening sessions and a lot of public events. Um, I know Mass Bike took, their, took our maps um, or our uh, questions to a lot of their events. Um, did anyone here participate in any of these events? A few. Um, so a few did, and it was really good. We did, um, I think the listening sessions are kind of the most unique as we, we didn't just go across the, the Commonwealth, but we also did different focus groups. So we talked to students and kids, which have a very different perspective than, you know, the, the senior center that was in, I think, Revere. And, um, you know, we talked to families and <coughs> disabilities and non-English speaking. So there was a very big, broad um, listening sessions where we learned a lot of um, interesting facts that we hadn't really thought about. And so here's some of the results. Um, and again, this is on our website. Um, but we know that people um, like to bike. <laughs> A social aspect to biking and that facility is that um, can pay, play a key into that. We also know that people want our facilities to be, be maintained better. We want, they want them to be cleared during the winter and so a lot of these um, items that we heard were turned and put into action items into our plan. So our vision is that we want to make biking in Massachusetts um, safe, comfortable, and convenient for everyday travel. Um, we also want to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries as well as increase the number of people that are taking short trips. So our plan was very focused on short trips. Um, how can we get people that are doing your everyday trips, how can we get them out of the car and onto a bike? So we have three key principles. I'm not gonna go through them all, but they're kind of big. You know, How do we make sure that we're um, designing for everyone, including the most vulnerable, and how are we addressing gaps and barriers, both perceived and physical barriers? Um, and then the third one was really lead by example. We own a very small part of the roads in the in this Commonwealth, and so how do we um, provide the tools and the resources and the lessons learned to communities so that they can take what we're learning and what we're doing into your, each and every community? So as I mentioned, we kind of collected all that data. We have six initiatives. They range from um, you know building infrastructure all the way down to collecting data. Um, and there's maintenance and snow and ice um, trickled in there, a lot about our project development. Um, and how we can get better projects um, to get better uh, facilities out there. Um, there's also an aspect of education. It kind of covers all of these, <laughs> um, all, all the E's that Galen had mentioned. Um, so we're making sure that we're addressing all of them. And so each of these action, each of these initiatives has, you know, three or four action items uh, that we've identified under each one. And then I think the big thing is for us to to, to measure. Let's do performance metrics. Let's see how we're doing. Let's make sure that we, so we have performance metrics for every action that we have so we can rate ourselves and see how we're doing. So kind of digging into it, as I said, we did data. And so what we did was we came up with a potential for everyday biking. And this is our demand 
model. And what it was is we took CTPS, took our short our transportation model that's usually used for automobiles, and we looked at short trips. And so they ran the model for all short trips. And this is kind of it's not exactly. There's other factors. We added transit. We added schools. Um, we added something else that I'm not the oh crashes. So those were our three other components that we added along to this data. And so you can see there's pockets of blue. Blue is the highest potential for everyday biking. So that's where a lot of short trips are happening on those corridors today. Um, and so it kind of gives us this priority as to where we can focus. And so here I zoomed into kind of where we are today. Um, and you can see, you know, Salem and Lynn and Swampscott and Peabody and Beverly, kind of those downtown centers that are real high potential for everyday biking. So those are where a lot of short trips are happening. And what we like to say, and I don't know if we can do this. What we like to think is, okay, so you've got these big blue areas where people could bike, let's invest and put infrastructure on those, and then let's look at some of these regional connections, like here's a good green connection of where you could connect people from one blue area to the other blue area, and so then we can start to think about network planning um, and all that, and starting to build out our network, and it also allows us to prioritize and really focus on where we can invest and where, we, where investing is making the most kind of bang for a buck. Um, so this is, we took that map and kind of superimposed it onto our roads. So this is looking at what streets MassDOT owns. Um, yep, go ahead. Is that modeled off of historical data or do you see, you know, hey, there's a big Amazon development here and a lot of employees can take a bike and is it future considerations or? I believe it's existing um, because I don't remember us taking it into future. But I'm not 100% certain on that. So, uh, but that's no, it's a good point. And we, so our initiative six, where we talk about data, we also have an action to rerun this in five years. So to keep challenging ourselves and make sure that we're always tackling the highest priority. Um, so we put this on our roads, and through that we were able to kind of think about what do we want to invest in now. And so we thought about well, safety is one key thing that we want to make sure we think about. We want to make sure we think about transit <coughs> access. We also want to make sure we're filling gaps in our network. And so we kind of identified high projects um, categories. And so this one's a high demand for walking and biking. This is out in Western Mass. Um, but it's a corridor that doesn't have continuous sidewalks. Um, there's a bus shelter. Uh, there's actually a crossing here, but you can see the sidewalks just end. Um, and so this is a, is, a, is a dense corridor that could be very, you know, uh, improve to make it better for walking and biking. You can see there's kind of shoulders, but we could put maybe in a buffered bike lane. So this is a quarter that we've, one of the examples of the quarters that we have identified to really invest and make better. Um, this one's over in Lowell. Um, this is a high crash location. Um, it's across the bridge. There's two intersections on either side of the bridge um, that have been high crash locations. And you can kind of see in the top, we have the bike lane in between travel lanes. Um, I'm sure lots of people don't feel comfortable biking in between that and you have that right turn and through, um, uh, the right turning vehicle in the through bicycle conflict area. And so that's something that we want to look at. And that's a simple, hey, maybe we can move that bike lane to the right side, put a single separation, kind of do quick short term improvements to make it more comfortable for everyone. <clears throat> this one is a, is a great example of what we have a lot across the country. Commonwealth here. So each of those pink lines is a high comfort facility. So it's a shared use path, a side pass, a buffered bike lane, or a separated bike lane. And they're so close, <laughs> but they don't connect. Uh, and so if we can connect those, per those per pink lines, we can unlock this huge network of connectivity. Um, and of course, there's an airport in the middle, so that creates its own challenges. Um, but this is another one that we want to look at. And, and here, I'll give you one second. Um, here's a perfect example, this shared use path ends um, right here with the bollard, <laughs> which we won't talk about, but it dumps you into a parking lot. So how can we get these, these connections and then we can start to unlock, you know, these miles of trail networks. Yes, did you have a question? Uh, is, uh, that's a perfect example to what you were just speaking of. Yeah. Along Lowell Street, where the probably spur that goes to into Danvers ends right there at Lowell Street. And then you have the, the two sections of the, the Greenway, which is uh, broken up by the two major highways, Route yep. 1 and, yep. and 95. Yep. Uh, we and PPD have vision to 
connect those two sections, actually the three sections, so that we can flow from through Danvers, through mm -hmm. PV, into Linfield when they build their, yeah. their path, yep. and continue to the Boston Road. Yep. presentation is the governor has initiated this interagency trails team um, and it really focuses on building that off path uh, shared use path network across the commonwealth and so we are actually starting a network planning exercise where we're taking all the shared use paths and kind of identifying where those those key gaps are and, and figuring out ways that we can address them through that trails team just as a side note there's uh, mass trails and it's a grant program for feasibility technical assistance around shared use paths. So if your community is looking into exactly those, you know, figuring out feasibility or you need design dollars, um, definitely look into the Mass Trails grants. There's actually an event this morning because they just announced um, the first round of awardees. Um, so next, I know there was a lot of community or folks here that communities are in the Complete Streets funding program, um, but just uh, quickly, um, kind of some background on this. And one is, as I said, we own a small percentage of the roads in the Commonwealth, and so we own 8%, and 92% um, of the roads are under the local jurisdiction, so we really are key in this partnership and lead by example and making sure that we're providing resources to our communities to build and work together to build these connected networks, because we can't do it, obviously, on our own. Um, here's a snapshot of those front pages of those um, municipal resource guides that we did as part of our plans and companion documents to address this exact issue of that we own such a small percentage of the road. So I would check those out. Um, the Complete Streets Funding Program is a three-tiered program. Um, the first tier is you pass a policy. You also have to, um, a municipal staff person <coughs> has to attend one of our Complete Streets trainings um, where we talk about best practices and a lot of what I've talked about today. Um, the second is you think about your community and you develop a prioritization plan. So you look at your network and you look at your gaps and you figure out, hey, I want bike lanes on this street or there's a sidewalk missing on this road and you develop a plan. Um, you submit that to us, we review it, we may provide comments or we approve it and then you're on to tier three. Tier three is where you can get um, construction dollars to build um, those projects. And so it's an application, it's a very competitive um, program that uh, we give um, anywhere between 10 and 30 communities um, funding every round. Uh, every year we do two rounds of applications. One's due May 1st, one's due in October 1st. Um, and so you can apply for that tier three. You can, can only apply to tier three um, once you've been approved in tier one and tier two. Um, I did forget to mention that tier two, there is technical assistance available. Um, so if you go to Mass Complete Streets, I think that's it, Done. Um, you can Google it. <laughs> um, they, there's um, forms that you can fill out in uh, the process to get technical assistance. Letting Eric take a picture. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is kind of where we sta stand today. Um, oh, I can't see those numbers on the screen. But we have 230 people that have registered, registered into our portal. We have, I believe, 200 exactly approved policies across, out of 351 communities, that's not bad. Um, we've had 161 pla um, plans approved, and then, oh, I don't know the t total number there, I think we're up to 70, we're I'm actually meeting with the secretary tomorrow to get permission on the next awardees, but to date we've awarded, I wanna say, $33 million in um, construction dollars. Um, this was a $50 million program for five years um, in last year's environmental bond bill, it was authorized for another $50 million. So um, it actually took us four years to spend the $50 million. So we'll be tapping into the, the hopefully we get authorized in actual real money, um, an authorization is in actual equal dollars. But um, this program has been a huge success. So hopefully next year we'll be tapping into that second $50 million to give out awards. Yes? So you do the approval, the city gets the funds. How do you, do you go back and check that they have that's a great question. So um, the, 
The way that the Complete Streets funding, the Tier 3 construction dollars work, is it's a reimbursement program. So we could enter a contract with the scope of work that tells you the work they're going to do and an estimate that has all the items. Um, and then after they're done, we take the invoices and compare to that estimate to make sure that they have done the work that they um, have said. So yes, it's a, uh, it's a reimbursement. So the town doesn't have to um, front the money and then we'll get reimbursed uh, later. Um, so again, I zoomed in here. Um, there's a lot of communities around here that have gotten construction dollars. That's the orange. Um, and then there's a few that have done policies, is it the solid green and then the uh, plans, so they could be applying for technical, um, for construction dollars soon, is the green with the dashed lines. Um, there's a few that have done, that have not entered the program and that's, that's okay. There's um, some communities that can do these resources, that can do these projects on their own and then some that are, that are not unfortunately interested. Um, we've tried to kind of tap into those doors and, and sometimes those doors close and sometimes they're <laughs> a little more interested. So um, we'll keep working on that. Uh, so here's kind of some examples. So before is on the top and afters are on the bottom. Um, and so here's kind of Dalton, which is a rural community, added a, a sidewalk. Uh, Littleton also added the sidewalk. Framingham did a sh shared use path through one of their parks. Um, here we have Lynn um, improved one of their intersections. I should have changed these to be in this region, but I didn't occur to me until just now. Um, and then Natick also did an intersection improvement with rapid flashing beacons. And in Taunton, they did, I wouldn't say a road diet, but they kind of narrowed, formalized the road. It was very wide um, and undefined. Um, and we're able to add buffered bike lanes and formalize the parking and travel lanes um, there. So that was a lot of information I gave you in a little over time. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, there's a three-tier process that mm -hmm. how, how well has the, the three tiers and the time frame it takes to go through that? How well does it dovetail with what the municipality had in terms of its plan? In other words, can you find that, you know, can you do it quickly enough to keep up with when they expect to do the work or whatever, or is it one of those things like it delays the project a lot? Or are, you, are, are you able to keep up with the municipalities, basically? Or um, are they not doing it because it, it's holding up the projects? Um, I think it's a little bit of a mix. Um, some communities will apply for, you're talking about the construction dollars specifically, yeah, because some, some people will apply for construction dollars to kind of offset a bigger project, and in some cases, if they're not awarded, they have to cover that cost for that construction project. Um, it, it's been interesting. Um, I think the fall is easier because people aren't on budget season. Right now, we're getting a lot of questions because the end of the year um, for municipalities and June 30th. And so they're planning for next year and they want to know if this money uh, will be available or not. Um, so we try to do this round as quickly as possible, um, but we also have to get all of our approval. So it, it sometimes aligns and sometimes it's a little more tricky. Um, it's also tough with the May deadline because we typically don't get them under contract till August. So there's very little communities that are ready to start construction at that point. A lot of times they can't actually get into the ground um, you know, if they're still working on design or they're waiting for that approval to start the design, uh, you know, they're not shovel ready until next spring. Um, so this one's a little, just a little tough on the communities. Whereas in October, they get noticed to proceed in January, they can theoretically get ready for shovel ready in, in April. Um, it's something we're trying to improve, but um, it's never perfect. <laughs> initiated this trails team. It 
wasn't, you know, it wasn't started from the bottom up. It was actually came from the governor's office down. And it's been great because we got DCR, EEA, who also builds trails, and the and MassDOT all in the same room every other week talking about how, you know, talking about how can we streamline this process, how can we get trails built faster, how can we, you know, work with other agencies. It's just, it's, I, I joke, I say it's the best meeting I go to every other week because we're all working towards this common goal, um, and it's great when you're, you have that collaboration. And I think, you know, a lot of the perception of the government is we work in our little silos, and, you know, that's not, not the case in that case. And that, but, um, you know, so we're lucky with the governor's push um, and the secretary's push, and even um, our administrator. Uh, there was once we were trying to push for a better design, and the administrator, the, the, the road owner didn't want to do it, and so the administrator was just like, fine, we'll, we'll just take it, it's ours. Like, if you don't want to do this better design, we'll just take over the road. And, and so that's amazing <laughs> um, that somebody is pushing and they get it. Um, and it's, it makes for a very easy work environment that is not constantly a struggle and a fight. Um, everyone seems to get it. And you know, I take for granted that we live in this kind of bubble, <laughs> um, I like to say, because I do a lot of Ashto stuff, which is, you know, across the, the, uh, the whole country, and you know, not a lot of states are, are doing what we're doing and, and have the, the understanding and the, the understanding about why and, and, and the importance of actually doing all of this stuff. So it's been very eye-opening because I've only been at the state now for like a year and a half. Um, Michelle, can you, can you speak to the district level though? The second part of the question is how did that filter down to yeah. like the districts where, you know, yeah, so the, around? I mean, you're, you're right. That is one tricky thing is that the districts are each, you know, scattered across the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. and so that's why kind of, we did that two-hour training about why we care. We invited everyone. If you were in construction, if you were a resident engineer, if you were driving the plow, if you, you know, we invited everyone at the district into that room and had some really hard but needed conversations of people being like, why do we want to do this, you know? But let's have those hard conversations because then everyone walked out of the room being like, okay, I get it now. And um, so, so that was really key in just making sure that we went out. And when we did that two-hour training, the secretary actually did a video just to kick it off. And so she was the one that set the tone at the start of every training. So it's not little old me coming in saying, you want to change your way. You know, it was coming, that message was coming from the top. Um, and so that adds power. Um, but it was great because there was one <laughs> district that was like, no, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do this. And then the next week somebody was like, oh, I had this meeting at the district that they just wouldn't stop talking about. What are we doing for people biking? And I was like, that's great, like our training worked. <laughs> and he was just like, but we're not doing anything. And I was like, that's okay, but that's good. Like they got the message. That's all we want, and to ask the questions. Um, so it's just changing that conversation. So I understand what you said, that the kind of bike lane you put in is specific to the community and its needs. But statistically, is there any model that encourages more biking and greater safety than those models you showed us? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's been a whole push kind of, let's go back here. And it really depends on the speed, the road, the volumes, uh, where people would feel comfortable. But typically, it's kind of like here over is where people feel more comfortable. Um, that's not to say that you can't feel comfortable in a bike lane. If you're on a low volume, low speed road in a bike lane, that's a very different feel than, you know, on 114 um, in a five foot shoulder. I grew up in Andover, so I'm very familiar with up here. Um, and then obviously, you know, shoulders and shared lanes. Shared lane markings can be great in the downtown's low speed, one way or, you know, just a more comfortable work vehicles are traveling much slower, it, that could be, that could work, but you know, not on these higher speeds. So speed, statistically, the sheriff's is less accidents? No, no, I'm saying uh, this way. So research has shown that when you provide separation, that um, the safety increases. Um, I didn't put this in here, I didn't think of it, but there is a chart. Um, uh, FHWA just came out with a bikeway selection guide and there's a chart in there that has volume and speed and it tells you like what facilities you should consider um, based on both your volume and speed. So that's something that uh, you can look into. Uh, yes? Another way of looking at this, perhaps, it's one thing to say you've done this work and bicyclists in general might feel better. What do the motorists feel? Because I mean, I'm sure most of us do drive. And how do we feel Yeah, so there's a lot of research that's shown 
found that when you have buffered and when you have separated bike lanes, that drivers prefer that because there's a lot of, um, what has, research has shown is that there's kind of stress with driving around people biking because you know most people don't want to hit the person biking and you know, you're traveling at different speeds and you're, you have to turn and what to do. There's a lot of kind of stress when you're driving with, around bicyclists. So the more you can separate, uh, the more comfortable both drivers and bicyclists will feel. The other key thing is there's um, the right hook. So if a bike is going through when a car turns in front of you, the further you can separate the bike from the turning car, the better visibility the person driving and the bicyclists have of each other. Um, and so that's kind of where the separated bike lanes, um, the, the woman that's waving to me when I took her picture. Um, so the more separation you can get, and that, that one's unique because there's parking, the buffer, so when you get to the intersection, there's a much better distance between seeing this. Um, in our separated bike lane guide, we have a graphic that shows you the bike and, and the car turning right in a standard bike lane and a separated bike lane. And when you're in the bike lane, the, when the bicyclist is in the bike lane and the car is turning right, the biker is in the blind spot. And when you pull them back and put them in the separated bike lane, they are not. The driver sees them in their, in their vision. So, be more specific, does so, the driver perceive this as an improvement when you go through these different things? Or does yes. the driver not perceive it as why are we doing all this? No, they do. I think that also comes with people using it. So a lot of times we hear, we go to a public meeting and we say, we're going to put a bike lane on this street. And people will say, hey, you put a bike lane over on this street and I've never seen a person biking on it. And that's where design and bike selection is key. If we just put bike lanes on high speed, high volume roads that no one's going to feel comfortable riding in, then it's a waste of our resources because we're not helping our case. We're not helping to build a connected network. We're just putting in a facility that people are gonna say, hey, you already did this and no one uses it. Why are you gonna do it on this street? And so that's where it's really key to make sure that we're building the right facilities so that it's more comfortable for people biking, people driving, and we're also building a network that people are using. We'll do like one more question. I know. One. Yeah. Michelle's gonna stick around. more and more questions. This is not the end. <laughs> uh, I feel like you had your hand up first. As a part of the to. <laughs> There's logistical liability problems, <laughs> as you can imagine. But, um, but we have talked about it, um, and we, we do encourage our staff to take rides, you know, mass bike or local streets or somebody is putting on a ride to, to consider that. There's also great videos out there that can kind of also share um, kind of that feeling that people can get. There's, there's, I know there's a video, there's, there's two that I, I like to use. There's one that London did of a bus driver sitting in a bus, in the bus seat, and he looks in his rear view mirror, and he looks in his rear view mirror, and he sees nothing. Then they open the door, and the guy gets out, and there's like 20 bikes. And that really shows you the blind spot around trucks. And so that's one that I like to use. And then there's also a company, it's in the United States, I believe, that put their drive bus drivers in a shoulder on a stationary bike, just told them to bike, and they drove the buses by them. And there was one woman that, I don't know if you've seen it, there's one woman that like was furious and was just like, nope, I'm done. Like, it was just, so, it's, it, so there's ways to do it. And I think that might have even been in a parking lot or maybe it was on the street. Um, so there's ways to do it without actually getting them on the bike. Um, and there was actually one that I just saw on Twitter. I retweeted, but um, somebody like was standing, I don't know if you guys saw it, there was somebody standing in, just next to it. They were actually on the sidewalk and a large truck drove by, but they like blew smoke and it just showed as the truck drove by, the smoke just stays right in their head, and it was just another eye-opening video. So you can do a lot with videos. There's a lot of um, educational tools that we use, um, both like infographics and short videos that we can kind of get those messages across, as opposed to physically taking them out there and riding bikes. A lot of our staff do ride bikes, so that's good too. Um, I mean, back when the Longfellow Bridge was being redesigned in Boston, I took the MassDOT project management team on a ride back and forth across the Longfellow Bridge during rush hour so they could get the full effect of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think everybody's 
entirely happy with, with the final product, but it, it definitely uh, made a difference in, in how they thought about it. Thanks, Michelle. Yes. Round of applause for Michelle. Now, please. Cool. Um, so then we're, we're okay on time. I'm not worried about things. But I think what I'd like to do, though, is after Nick's presentation is take 15 or 20 minutes, maybe 15 minutes at this point, um, to get into groups to talk about how we can engage in the complete streets process. Um, so think over the next presentation, um, Nick's going to talk about more local stuff with the city of Salem, but the idea of um, you're all advocates, you may have learned some things today, but you may have known some things today, but how do we spread the message to get engagement as our tool? So think about that. Um, Complete Streets does involve local input and advocate input and resident input as well as municipal buy-in and funding and design policies from the top. So this is, it's a beautiful process because it involves everybody from the top to the bottom and the middle. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the middle. Um, so Nick Downing from the city of Salem, I don't know if there's anything else we need to jump into, but I'll pull up the Complete Streets page, or? Um, I, yeah, my presentation is even less formal than Michelle's, and then I don't have one. I'm just going to talk a little <laughs> bit um, about what we've been doing in the city of Salem, um, kind of both in the time that I've been here, and then kind of some, some work that happened previously. I'm going to try really hard to not step on my colleague Tom Devine's toes too much. He's going to talk about the bike master plan um, that we just finished up and have a final draft of now that we're going to be um, working on and implementing kind of in the, in the coming years. I think it's one of these ones I can. Um, yeah, I'll pull. Cool. Probably. That's actually, that's our work. I'll brag about that too. Okay, great. Right, we'll put it up there. Um, so, as Galen mentioned, my name is Nick Daddick. I'm the assistant director of the traffic and parking department for the city of Salem. Um, and I'm just going to talk kind of a little bit about the city's experience and kind of going through the complete streets program that, that Michelle just laid out. Um, so, that program became law back in 2014. Um, and Salem was one of a handful of communities that really kind of jumped at the opportunity um, to actually enact a policy right away. So it'll actually be five years since we passed our policy as of tomorrow. Um, and that was kind of right after the state program, before the state program was really even fleshed out. I think Salem was one of the, the communities that realized this was going to be a great opportunity for us to really kind of codify some of the things that I think the city had been trying to do up to that point uh, and then really kind of give us some focus going forward. Um, so after we, after the program at the state uh, was passed and after the city passed its policy, um, the city's policy called for a pretty wide-ranging working group to be set up um, with folks from a lot of various departments and divisions. Um, and it was, I think the, the intent was right and the, the goal made sense, but it was a relatively big group and getting that group all in one place I think proved to be pretty difficult. Um, so actually in 20, so in 2014 my department didn't exist at all. Um, my department started in 2016 um, when we hired our first director of traffic and parking um, and we're now on to our second Dave Kacharski um, and I think it's been good to have that department because it's really kind of given a home to some of this work where you want a, a broad coalition of supporters at the local level um, but you also need some folks I think especially within the city government who are really going to be kind of the, the leaders on it to make sure that some of these things are continuing to move forward. Um, so I think in the last few years um, with, with the new department we've seen kind of more um, again, making sure that all of these things are beginning to get included in our kind of everyday work that we're doing throughout the city. Um, and for us, I think it's really been kind of a, a two-pronged approach. So through the state program, um, the city has been uh, awarded a Complete Streets grant. Um, it was for the intersection of Lafayette, Loring, and West, which if some of you are locally might be familiar with, that's one of the main intersections down by, down by Salem State. Um, so Lafayette kind of comes south right out of downtown. Um, and we were able to get the grant for that intersection, and that's a, a big project. But then the other really important thing, to Michelle's point, you know, there are big projects and there are state-owned roads, but so much of our uh, road system here in Massachusetts is locally controlled. So how do we make sure that on our local roads for all of our local projects, not just the big you know, intersection redesigns, but the everyday maintenance, milling, repaving, all of that, how are we incorporating our complete streets policy into that work? Um, and we have, I think, over the course of the five years since we adopted the policy, seen some improvements in that. Um, I think that whereas previously a lot of the times um, for our local advocates it was a matter of arguing for any accommodation to be included in a road rate project, we're moving to a point now where it's not a matter of we need to argue for an accommodation, it's now making the case for what level of accommodation. It's not just saying 
please do something for bikes, please improve the, the pedestrian network. It's more focused on, we know that we need to improve the pedestrian network, we know we need to improve the bicycle network, and in this context, what situation or what kind of level uh, of intervention makes sense. On some of our local streets, that is gonna be you know, just the sheriffs if it's coming through a really low volume residential area. Uh, but when we ramp up to things like looking at, again, Lafayette Street, we have bike lanes out there right now, um, but those bike lanes, you know, we might be able to, in the future, be looking at an improvement there that actually offers either a buffer, potentially parking, protected bike lanes, and things like that. And I think that we've, we've been lucky that um, our engineering department in DPW, I think in recent years, have really started to embrace that. Um, and I'd say for those of you who either have policies and don't yet have prioritization plans or haven't gone for the construction grants or do even don't have uh, the policies yet, I think getting early buy-in from engineering, from DPW, uh, makes all the difference in the world. Um, because my, my department, again, is relatively new. We don't, we're not in charge of DPW or engineering or anything like that. Um, and so ultimately, a lot of the money that comes from the state through Chapter 90, uh, a lot of the, the road movement that comes from the city kind of flows through that department. So if you can get there by, and if they're involved early on, if they understand that this isn't a matter of completely changing everything that they're doing, but it's just a kind of a, a refocus uh, and making sure that we're looking at all of our streets in terms of accommodating all users. When you can get that buy-in on their side, you can really, I think, start to see a difference. Um, so I'd say that's, you know, for those of you in the room, <coughs> excuse me, who are kind of in that process right now, you know, build that coalition as broad as you can at the beginning, but also make sure that you're identifying those folks locally who are really going to lead it. Um, I know different cities and towns have different structures. Not everyone's going to have, you know, a department that is solely focused on this work. Um, but still trying to figure out who that could be, whether it is an existing board or commission, um, existing folks within the city infrastructure and the city structure, um, it's really important to do that. Um, and you know, I, I think that there is kind of, there's the easy sell to this and that I think when you sell a lot of people, you know, if you pass this policy, if you go through this process, you get access to more money. We know our cities and towns need more money for all their roads. Um, you know, the, the Chapter 90 money from the state is great, but we know that there's a, a backlog in terms of maintenance. So when you can identify additional money uh, that can flow into your city or town for roadway projects, um, I think that really resonates with some folks. Um, <clears throat> but it's also then a matter of changing that behavior. And so it's, it's not just we're going to get more money and we can go do more paving, but the paving that we're going to be doing is going to be focused on every time we go out and touch the roadway, how can we be improving it for all users. Um, so that's been kind of our experience so far. Um, we're trying to do some of the things that uh, Michelle talked about in terms of you know, trying to identify ways that we can really uh, encourage use, um, trying to do some kind of quick, cheap stuff um, that actually uh, you know, kind of shows people some of the space that we do have available. Um, we're looking at some opportunities this summer to potentially do some uh, pop-up protected bike lanes at a couple different locations in the city. Uh, again, to kind of show that we have these roads. Um, to, you know, in Salem, we have a lot of old, narrow roads, but we do have a handful uh, of pretty wide commercial corridors that come through the city where a lot of the roadway space is still just devoted to cars um, and trying to identify how we can actually show that we have space to accommodate uh, all users on that roadway as well. We can do that in an uh, inexpensive way temporarily and, and kind of get some, some buy-in to do a more full-time permanent intervention down the um, so that's kind of been our experience so far. Again, this is relatively brief, but I want to make sure to uh, give an opportunity to folks who are still going through the process um, in terms of asking questions about kind of how we got there or why we went there. Just a quick, as you mentioned repaving, have you gone through the process of thinking about the water inundation and making the paving for us and where the water's going to go? Um, like we thought our, our own whole way. I don't think we've rethought our entire way of paving, no. Um, certainly on, on certain projects, we've tried to identify opportunities, especially if we're doing um, more on the sidewalks and kind of the, the areas off the roadway for, for porous materials, um, for catch basins and things, uh, for kind of rain soils and things like that. Um, but in terms of the actual materials we're using on the roadway, we haven't made kind of any changes to that yet.
I think from the city side, the, the reason that I think we're starting to see more of that is because with limited dollars, you want to spend them as efficiently as you can, and oftentimes you want to spend them on the things that are going to last, because um, one of the big frustrations that we always come across is we might go out and we might paint a new crosswalk, we might paint a new uh, bike lane or other bike infrastructure, um, but then it fades so quickly that all of a sudden we're kind of back to, to square one and there's nothing there, and people might have gotten used to the previous accommodation, but it is important then to find that balance between all right, we want to make it long lasting, but we need to make sure that we're using materials that aren't going to potentially, as you mentioned, it's slippery, put folks in danger as they're kind of entering and exiting. Yeah. Yes? Three dimensional crosswalk painting. Yeah. Uh, I've seen uh, over in Bedford there. So, just so by way of background, to show yeah. uh, awareness that is there. Right. So, by way of background, if folks aren't familiar with this, that's not a series of floating blocks of the crosswalk. That's just forced perspective in paint. So, if you're looking at that from the other angle, it looks very, very strange. But the idea is that specifically for folks in cars who are coming to this intersection, it's really to raise awareness and say, this is pedestrian space. You should expect pedestrians to be here. And it's supposed to kind of give you some, some pause because if you don't know that that's not floating blocks, you might be very worried for what's about to happen to your car. Um, <clears throat> in terms of using this to kind of highlight bike infrastructure, I, I think there are probably some very creative people who could figure out a way to do that. I haven't seen it used in that application yet. And we would need, you would kind of need to figure out where you're trying to, to highlight that. So it might be at something kind of in the, the turn intersection. What's that? Obviously intersection. Right, but I, in terms of kind of where you put it to, to make the highlight, because this will highlight your pedestrian activity. But then what does that look like if we're trying to, to highlight kind of that there's going to be bikes there as well? It's certainly an interesting idea. I mean, I, I love this idea. I desperately want to do this somewhere in Salem. Um, it's a really interesting way to, again, it just it, it highlights the fact that that's pedestrian space and you should be looking for and expecting pedestrians there. Well, that was my question too that I have, but I, I, uh, and I was going to ask a few minutes ago, but I, I didn't know whether that works if you're, if you're parallel, if you're parallel to it. In other words, for a bike line. Mm -hmm. so, so that was, the perception is, is that I can't go over to that right because I'm, right. I'm going to hit a curve or something. Right, yeah, almost make it look like a curve. Yeah, yeah. Make a, yeah. So that, that was my question, is yeah. could you make the bike lanes Vastly more, more safe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can do a lot with paint. Ultimately, I think there are probably slightly easier ways if we're looking to provide kind of buffered protection between car car lanes and bicycle lanes. Um, just the the physical space of the buffer is important, um, but also then if you can look at things like delineators and flex posts, um, that I can you know, that gives you kind of that vertical separation as well that we know makes cyclists feel more comfortable. Again, I think to the point that Michelle made, it makes drivers feel more comfortable and that they know and expect and know where those cyclists are going to be a little bit more. Um, so I, I, again, I don't think we've seen pain used to kind of try and do kind of a forced perspective, make it look like there's a curve where there's not. Um, but I'm sure, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see that if someone, again, more creative than I could come up with a way to make it work. So just from the state perspective, we don't allow this. <laughs> <laughs> but we can show um, the roads and all. There's, We're do uh, that there's actually been a lot of research around this that has actually increased crashes. So still kind of out there. Um, there's been kind of a lot going back and forth. Uh, the feds do not support this, which is kind of where we do not. I felt like I had to put my disclaimer <laughs> uh, in. The so uh, I wonder if you could speak to when 
bike share was adopted in Salem it was around the same time as the Blue Streets policy, and whether the use of the bike share system, any data from it, has helped inform interventions in Salem is taken uh, to make the streets safer. Sure. Uh, so we're in our se- Tom, from second or third, we're in our third year um, of the Zagster bike share program here in Salem. <laughs> Um, it's been wildly successful here so far. We expanded it this year with additional stations. Um, it's actually been a great partner for us and kind of, um, you know, we have our, the, there's kind of the traditional bike share system that is all bikes at docks like you see with blue bikes in and around Boston. Um, we kind of started that on a smaller scale here in Salem, um, but we actually moved to a hybrid that we have the official docks and then we let folks uh, pick up and drop off the bikes um, at all of our public bike racks as well. Um, and I think that did is absolutely fed into what we've been trying to do, especially um, through the, what Tom will talk about later with the bike master plan. Um, I think it's absolutely showed some desire lines that we maybe didn't see before. Um, it's showed that some people, if you give them a bike, they will go anywhere with it. Um, you know, the bikes are here in Salem, but they have been to Swampscott, they've been to Marblehead, they've been up to the Mall in Danvers, they've been to Peabody. Um, you know, we've seen them end up in all these places. Um, so. It's not, there are obviously those kind of quarters that we've seen heavy use on, but you do see those outliers and it really kind of indicates that there are people there who need a way to get around, um, you know, who it might be too long to walk, but they might not have access to a car and might not be served by transit, uh, and bikes really fill in that niche. Um, And it's absolutely, you know, what we've seen with that so far is encouraged that we want to continue to expand that system. Um, So it's it's definitely kind of informed where we're looking at, and it was, that information I think was, was folded into the bike master plan and was a consideration in terms of determining where we're going to um, be looking for some of that, those interventions going forward. Uh, electric car charging stations are far and few between. I mean, it's nice to see them, but in order to take a 30-minute walk and turn it into a 15-minute bike ride to go from the station to my errand, is there any focus where you, like, this might be a location that you get a lot of leverage? Um, are there any specific locations like schools that you try to leverage that traffic? Um, for electric vehicle charging stations? Yeah. Um, not that I'm familiar with specifically. I know, we, we, like you said, we have a handful of them in the city, um, but we haven't really, I don't think we've done any, a comprehensive look at where we might want those. Right, another one in the garage, right? Um, they're at the, yeah, there's, so there's some at the city garage and there's some at the MBTA garage. Actually, I might play off that. Is that might be something to talk, think about in a, in a network plan of connectivity to charging stations. Because mm-hmm. you say if you're going to leave your car for a couple hours to let it charge, you should be able to bike and walk from that safely. Right. So I'm almost thinking of it almost like a transit node. Yep. You know, you want to have good crosswalks by a bus stop. You want to have good crosswalks by a charging station because people will drive there, but then they have to leave their car. Right. So that might be something that hasn't really come into the conversation yet. But I know the Commonwealth is investing heavily under this governor in charging stations throughout, I don't know, it's something in the multiple hundreds, 800 or more of new charging stations that will come online in the next couple of years. And part of that was a windfall from the Volvo diesel gas, Volkswagen, Volkswagen, thank you. Sorry, Volvo. Uh, The Volkswagen (laughs) diesel gas issue. So uh, a lot of that money is going towards charging stations. So we're going to see a lot more of that around. So maybe now is a really good time to start Interjecting that into the conversation of planning of networks. Yeah. Well, Volkswagen is, uh, is moving forward, and I think some of the U.S. manufacturers are moving forward to uh, providing a more electric hybrid vehicles for purchase in the future in the next 10 to 15 years, going away from uh, gas powered vehicles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've seen the, the ad for the new. Volkswagen Plus, all electric vehicle, and you if you follow up on YouTube and you, you'll get a lot of that information about uh, their ideas with uh, electric vehicles. And I think that in the, in the future, Volkswagen will not be selling uh, until the combustion engines. Yeah, interesting. They'll be all electric. Cool. cool. Anything else, Nick? Great. Round of applause for Mr. Jamie here. Thanks. Um, so one thing I do want to point out on here is that, of course, Mayor Driscoll signed this, and a lot of it comes from the top. So keep in mind that, you know, though the policies may be coming from the governor, from the DOT HQ, you have to have the local buy-in from your 
your head of your local municipality. Um, mayors are the key to a lot of unlocking a lot of what we're asking for. Um, to Tim's point, one of the biggest changes I was able to make as an advocate was to take Mayor Walsh on a bike ride. And he saw Com Ave for what it was, and soon we're going to have a protected bike lane on Com Ave. I don't think we would have gotten that had we not gotten the mayor. So, something to keep in mind when you're thinking about engagement. What I'm going to want us all to do is stand up real quick, stretch it out. We've been sitting for far too long. Shake it out a bit. We are a public health initiative right now. Um, I'm going to ask us to, we have three tables set up. I'm going to ask us to brainstorm. The prompting is from your perspective, from wherever you sit as an advocate, as a professional, as an engineer, as just somebody who came in for the food, just talk about how we can engage in complete streets. Whether it's, and I wrote down two already that were, were prompted. One was a bike ride with municipal and district folks, and another one was a pop up by a protected bike lane. So those are two ideas that I heard in the presentations and the questions about how to engage complete streets. But um, I want you to tap into what you know and share what you know. Um, we've been doing a lot of presenting at people so far. This is an opportunity for you in small groups and you can move tables. I don't really have assignments, but I'm gonna ask you to just to move to one of those tables and the prompting is engagement in complete streets process. And in the end, we'll type up these and, and share these with not just the advocates and the email us, but you know, we'll have these on our website and be able to share with everybody. Um, and we'll take about 10 minutes to do this and uh, then we'll jump into our next presentation. Thank you. It's so tiny. Okay. Too small. Great. Um, and if there's any concerns, any questions, um, feel free to come to me with any augmenting of air conditioning, of questions about you can't hear anything, just you know, feel free to chime in. Let's do it. Let me get Tom's in here first. Can you have people? Oh, yes. I will. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. One thought to him is to kind of like, you can move everybody from the <laughs> yeah. back rows. I could just take a bunch of rows away. Of course, I'm raising the floor. I sat a little bit more. I was like, oh, that's a bunch of pictures. I know. Um, can you help me encourage the best bunch of folks to not just collect, but especially in the round tables? Yeah. Try to break them up and separate them into their various tables. Sure. Or maybe they're doing it naturally. Now they're all with us. Yes.
other cars, they might so be, you know, here. slightly different adapters, but they, they can too uh, just plug in. They're going to be in there for a reason. Now. They're going to visit the coffee shop, and they're going to be walking from that car charging station to the retail that's, that's what I found. Is that's the charging
think there's a lot of like things that you can get covered from the bike. Well, in Paris, the last time I was biking there, the bus lane, the bike lane, share. Yeah. Stand that, but there you go.
scoping of the flames, but how can it really change the policy as a whole? Fleet Streets as a policy, I mean, obviously the changes that affect you as a biker, as a walker, as a transit rider, or just as a person driving, or just a general person, it's on a very localized, hyper-local, street-by-street basis, but it comes from a policy. We didn't have the policy, we didn't have the funding, we didn't have the right positions in place, we wouldn't get down to the boots on the ground level. So as the day goes on, I want you to think about that as like, how do we actually see the change that we want in the systems that we live in? So keep that in mind as well. But I love the, the concepts that we've got going here. Oh, I forgot to put my video. I'm gonna have for one second. And just to note, this will all be on our Facebook page. We are Facebook living this. So say hi to Facebook, everyone. Okay, there we go. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, see if we can get to the A-B technical difficulties. All right, um, thank you. We'll have one more uh, bucket of topics, then we'll do a quick break for lunch and workshopping. Um, the next conversations we're gonna have are about more of the network planning. So how do we think about things as they connect? Now, again, we're trying to keep uh, sensibly kind of like a public health access, um, open space concepts. Think of the five E's, think of the four questions when you think in the back of your mind when you're watching these presentations and absorbing some of the information. Um, we have Tom Devine from the city of Salem who will talk about the Salem Bike Master Plan, which was released, not that, what, how many? 2018. 2018, just a couple months ago, right? Six months ago? End of last year? Yeah. So um, it's relatively fresh for the city of Salem to think about what the bike network will look like. In November, I'll pull up your slides here. Sorry for the, we're trying to do everything all at once. We're doing a good job though, right? Thanks for the feedback, I appreciate that. <laughs> cool, do um, you wanna stand here? You wanna do the controls again? Great. Um, so yeah, so I'll leave it to Tom to go into a little bit about what's going on in Salem. Um, then we'll have Anna to talk about a kind of a broader scale, regional and even statewide conversation about how we're actually tracking our metrics and getting uh, data that can back up what our plans have in place. Tom. I'm Tom Devine, Senior Planner for the City of Salem, Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, can you guys hear me in the back? I'm not used to using a microphone. Let me see if I can help here. Okay, how's this? Any better? Now we're good. Try to get into him? Hello, hello. Hey. Okay. <laughs> so, I don't know, I'll just start again. <laughs> My name is Tom Devine, I'm a senior planner for the City of Salem Department of Planning and Community Development. I am going to give a brief high level overview of Salem's 2018 bike master plan. I'm going to talk about the planning process, quickly highlight some key projects, and I hope that we can have a little bit of a discussion about implementing the plan to actually build the network that we call out in the plan. Um, so, we, we hired Tool Design Group, a consultant that did the majority of the work, but it was also done with the support of city staff and members of Salem's very active bike, um, our, our bike committee. Um, we have three members of the bike committee here now, Eric Petty in the back, uh, Ray Schwartz here in the front, and Michael Williamson down in the back too. Um, the plan wouldn't have been the same without them. They, um, went above and beyond and did a lot of extra work that really made a difference. So I just want to give them credit for that. Is your bike committee part of the town or any? They are confirmed by city council. But their volunteers are putting in extra time above and beyond their day jobs. Um, I think Salem is a very complex place with many layers more than you can fit on the slide, but I just want to highlight some things that are relevant to transportation. Um, you, you might know Salem has 43,000 residents over eight square miles. That doesn't really tell the whole story of Salem's character because about a third of our land area 
is made up of protected open space, parks, cemeteries, um, and golf courses. So it's really five or six square miles that's urban area with 40 plus thousand people. Uh, the, the city is economically and ethnically diverse. Um, Salem is not a veteran community. About 17,000 people do leave Salem every morning to work elsewhere. However, just about the same amount come in from outside to work in Salem. So that's that kind of um, circulation every day. Um, I think a defining feature of Salem's transportation situation is that we have no direct highway access. But on the other hand, we do have downtown commuter rail access as well as seasonal ferry um, service on Derby Street. Um, Tool Design Group's graphic here is a good snapshot of mobility in Salem because it shows that our compact um, urban core is pretty much all walkable. However, a, a challenge in Salem is that some of our biggest institutions are, are spread out far from downtown. So Salem State University and South Salem, um, our largest employer, North Shore Medical Center, off of Highland Ave. They're outside the downtown core. But this shows the potential of biking to make those 10 minute trips cover a lot more of the city. Um, and just a really <coughs> quick look at the existing infrastructure. Although um, the biking distance isn't a huge problem in Salem, our bike infrastructure is, uh, <coughs> is sparse and fragmented. On this graphic, you can see it doesn't differentiate between on street and off street facilities, but you can see that there's major gaps and very limited coverage. Um, outreach, of course, is a key part of any planning process we do. There's a default level of outreach we're gonna do in any planning process, and that's usually having a steering committee and doing some kind of public meetings. In this case, Tool Design Group put a lot of energy and creativity in one of our open houses, and it turned out to be a tremendous success with high attendance, all these activities that engaged the participants and drew out a lot of good input. So that was really a high note that I think helped galvanize bike enthusiasts um, who were participating in this process. Um, we also had two community bike rides where city staff and um, tool design group uh, went out on the road and invited members of the public to come and ride with us to see our existing infrastructure. And in the middle picture, you can see, uh, facing this way, that's Ward 2 Counselor Christine Medor, and behind her is Representative Paul Tucker. Their participation is a, a real boost to morale for anyone who's working on this kind of thing, just to know that they're involved and, um, and supportive. And actually, when we did this, I didn't know that Paul Tucker was uh, a bike enthusiast. Eric Petty suggested that I reach out to him about this. I didn't think I'd get a response, but hey, he ended up coming. So I was pleased about that. Um, there's a, a real limitation to this kind of outreach though, where you might only have bike enthusiasts who self-select and participate. So we went a little bit broader. Tool Design Group put up an online mapping tool where anyone from the public could um, go online and draw routes or desired bike routes, identify barriers and gaps, and make comments on the map of Salem. Um, so that was helpful. We also, in order to make sure we were going beyond just the enthusiasts, um, I worked with um, my colleagues to go out and find people that probably weren't on their own going to come and participate in the planning process. So we um, went out and interviewed people in the local business community, um, <coughs> local developers, representatives at Salem Hospital and the Salem Public Schools. And that was very enlightening because I think we learned that the business community and the development community, they're actually supportive and enthusiastic about biking. So they're ready when the city takes the lead to go further with bike infrastructure. And they'll, they'll come on board. But we also learned that we have a lot of work to do with Salem Hospital and the Salem Public Schools to um, get them a little more excited about biking. Um, like I said, this is a very high level presentation, so there's a, a lot of data and analysis that I'm not showing here. And one of them, as, as was discussed um, with, with Nick Downing, um, our very successful bike share program 
has given us tremendous data. When you ride a Zagster bike, if you leave your phone on, it tracks your route. So every Zagster biker is tracked. Everywhere uh, a, um, a ride is started or ended are tracked. So we're never gonna have data like that for bikes outside the bike share. So that was um, hugely helpful. Uh, but what Tool gave us, based on the data, their analysis, and the public input, was 87 recommended infrastructure projects, 15 policy recommendations. We uh, did a lot of work with our steering committee to come up with a prior prioritization methodology. We had to determine um, how we divide the weight among all these different uh, categories, safety, demand, public input, and equity. And in addition, we further categorized the uh, recommendations by short, mid, and long term uh, based on cost and complexity. So we completed the plan in 2018, and now we're implementing it. Um, we kept Tool Design Group on to keep the momentum going and do some preliminary design work for our main corridors, Ford Ave, Bridge Street, Mac, North Street, Jefferson Avenue, and Washington Street. The um, Salem Planning Board has adopted bike storage guidelines for the development projects that they review. We are trying to catch up and add public bike parking throughout the city. We have a lot more to do, but we are getting started. And we continue to support, um, with, along with our sponsor partners, the local bike share, as it grows and increases in ridership. Um, I also want to highlight three key projects that are funded and are definite, um, because they're major pieces of the network that fill um, some of the major gaps that you see in that existing conditions map. Um, the first one is the Bridge Street Project, MassWorks funded project in the uh, Bridge Street, North River, Glover Hollow neighborhood. Um, this is a, a neighborhood that's slated for about 400 new housing units in the coming years. We've already moved a community life center over there. Um, this project will add separated bike lanes from along Bridge Street, from Boston Street to Flint Street, where it will pick up with the existing lanes, the existing bike paths through Leslie's Retreat Park, which brings you to the MBTA station. It also adds another uh, leg of bike path going off on this graphic. Um, where there's a gap behind a public storage building, it will, it will connect that to where there's an existing path. Behind the new apartment building at 28 Goodview Street, which brings you to Goodview Street. Across Goodview Street, the Salem Oil and Grease development will have a path going through it when it's built. Um, that will go over the train tracks through the site, over the North River, and to um, Harmony Grove Road, where there is clearly a gap from there to Peabody um, that we need to work on as well. Another key project that's coming is phase two of the Mayor Salvo Canal Street bike path. So you might have seen that we recently completed the top green part, about 2,000 feet from um, Roswell Street, the middle of Canal Street, to um, Washington and Mill Street at, uh, at Domino's Pizza. So phase two would be the red segment connecting that first segment to the existing path that goes through Salem State to uh, the Marblehead path. And the way I see it, there really is a phase three that needs to be done too. If you see the northern end of the existing path, it, it kind of just dumps out into a busy intersection without any direction. So a tool design group is looking at that trying to come up with some alternatives that we can consider. And my final key project is um, what I've been calling the Harbor Connector Path. So here, up on top of the map, it was converted from coal to gas, reduced its operations from 60 acres to 20 acres on this waterfront site, so there's still 40 acres that are up for some kind of redevelopment that, that is inevitable. The site, the 40 acres, will have uh, a path network. Um, this project will connect Salem's path network to that path network. There's also another leg that goes 
around Collins Cove, a thousand feet to the Bentley School. And I mean, I was told that I couldn't tell anyone this until today, but we are receiving a Mass Trails grant for this project that was announced this morning. So that's the, the good news that I bring you. So that's my um, presentation on the bike master plan. We're, we're doing some big things to advance the plan and implement the projects. Uh, but to be honest, these key projects I'm showing you would have been funded and would happen either way. Um, so it, it leads me to bring the question to you to lead a discussion about implementation strategies. What else we can do to make sure that our bike master plan doesn't just sit on the shelf. Last October, we actually squeezed our October carnival into um, the left side there in one of the lanes, and you know residents panicked, but it actually showed that um, that part of Washington Street before you get to Bridge Street is ridiculously wide, five lanes, and one of them is clearly absolutely redundant. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of width to work with there. Um, in addition. There are two vacant courthouses that the city has an RFP out for. And that RFP actually includes a municipal parking lot next to the new MBTA garage. So um, that, as well as um, work we have contracting with Tool Design Group to do, is taking a look at this to come up with a solution. And I don't know what the solution will be, but we're just starting to look at it. But not, yeah, it really does need work. thoughts on implementation, but, but also a question about equity. On implementation, uh, are you thinking about uh, how to incorporate the project recommendations from the bike plan into the next iteration of your complete streets prioritization plan? Because that, that will be coming up, because those are, those are five-year plans, theoretically, anyway. Um, and, and so that's, that's one way to kind of get things in the implementation pipeline to get the, onto the prioritization plan. Um, the other thing is, um, have you thought at all uh, about how public works is going to incorporate um, the recommendations from, from the bike plan into their day-to-day -day operations as they're out there doing maintenance and repaving projects. Can Tom I ask you to repeat the question for the folks in the back? So, uh, <laughs> question one is, how do the recommendations relate to complete streets and how we can use the tools of mobile lab? Well, well moving, moving the recommendations from the master plan into the next iteration of your complete streets prioritization plan um, which, which is more implementation focused once it's on the prioritization plan. And also, 
integrating the bike master plan with the, with your public works department's sort of day to day work. Yeah. The city has no single master plan, but has all these different plans. And one of the challenges that I think we're actually okay at dealing with is getting every plan to connect with the other plan next to it. So it's like a Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap between the complete streets uh, prioritization and the bike master plan. So it actually so far has worked a little bit backwards from what you're describing, where we had the prioritization plan for complete streets. All of that is folded into the bike master plan. We need to keep going forward to make sure that the bike master planes fold into the complete streets prioritization. Right. Um, there's certainly a lot of overlap. And um, you asked about getting GPW to incorporate the master plan into what they do. And um, that's a shift that's hard to turn, but we are having a lot of, um, we're making a lot of progress with that. So um, even just to start, um, we're trying to get a systematic way to map all the recommendations. Oh, we have done this. We mapped all the recommendations onto the, um, the mapping tools that DPW uses. When they're looking at a project, they can pull up what are the bike plan recommendations that are for that. So also, um, like I can tell you, for this project, um, this is a project I, as a bike advocate, wanted to see done. So I just went ahead and wrote the grant application to give the engineering department the money to do it. That's, that's one Great. implementation strategy. And then on the equity side, I, I was happy to see equity was, was one of the criteria uh, on, on the slide that uh, talked about the, the projects in, in the bike plan. Um, how was equity incorporated in, into that project selection? And uh, were any representatives of any equity target populations actually involved in the decision-making process? Well, so equity was incorporated in two ways. One is tool taking data on income and minority population. Um, I, th I think the things that the state uses to define uh, environmental justice areas, essentially, so that that gave weight to projects in the prioritization. Um, beyond that, I, I have to admit, I never feel like we do enough. We, we put out meeting materials in Spanish, and we have translators available, but to be honest, those services aren't always fully taken advantage of. We made an effort to um, meet with the staff at the uh, North Shore Community Development Coalition, which does a lot of work in the Point neighborhood, which is where we have our highest immigration neighborhood. Um, so that's what we did in the back. Hi, um, so I noticed you have 87 infrastructure recommendations. I'm guessing like 85 of them are single intersections. Um, but uh, it, so that, it seems like the pieces that you're putting in place are again somewhat fragmented. Um, the Bridge Street project, you have one coming from the next and one coming from Flint Street and then there's that two lane section in the middle that's poorly made and plus 
um, Salem Bike Community webpage. Um, Michael? Um, I'm going to read from the press release released in 2016 about the Bridge Street project, so that I get the words correctly. The city has received 3.5 million in funding to make the Flutter Hall of Area Born Body of Pedestrians and Bicyclists. Uh, we are elated to receive the funding and so grateful to the governor for this money. <coughs> We are going to get right on it, the mayor said. That was three years ago. Okay, so what happened? You want to hear the excuse? <laughs> <laughs> um, Can you hear the excuse? What's the delay with the um, <coughs> the Bridge Street Massworks project that we received three plus million dollars in state grant funding for in 2016? And, um, we read the press release where we're saying we're getting right on it. Um, so the holdup is a, a permitting issue with um, Mass TEP. I don't know how deep I need to get into this, but this is an area that floods, and there's some disagreement with the DEP about whether it's coastal flooding or inland flooding, and um, we're arguing about how to provide compensatory flood storage throughout this. Um, so what it means is that we, we're going to tweak the design to do this project probably next year. But that, that permanent issue was the whole about Mass TEP. As you know, I lived there, and I got so excited to read that press release, and then three years later, nothing. Yeah, I need to recognize that as a planner. My sense of space and time can be different from yours. <laughs> if I see that something's funded, I just feel good that I know it's going to come eventually, even if it takes years. There's a lot to this, and I'm not an expert. Oh, that's fine, but I'm just wondering how you, what your basic, you got four, four criteria, safety, demand, input, and equity. Yeah, so, you know, we had the 87 recommendation, and the question was, what order of priority do they go in? So, um, tool, do this in a very data-oriented way. There's a lot of data behind each of those criteria, and um, the, the choices we made with our work group how much weight to give each of those criteria. So safety had safety data. What, what were bad intersections? So a safe fatal injury and not fatal injury. Yeah, it's probably similar to the way that Tool did ours as well. It's probably similar to the way that the um, Bridge Street Bike Committee did theirs. Yeah. Um, but it's not And in reality, the, the plan is a plan. It's not a 100% um, uh, mandate for oh, where we're going. So, um, you know, there's many factors that affect what order projects get done. And, uh, the obvious one is funding availability. And um, another one is um, if another project comes up that's related, we want to use that opportunity to make sure bike infrastructure is included. We can turn to the bike master plan to see what bike infrastructure is um, is planned for, say, a place with a water main break and they have to rebuild the street. Um, 
on my right, on my right in the back. It's capital improvement funding locally, so it's, it's bonded money for infrastructure. Yeah, when, when I got involved in this, um, this was something that was already starting, and to me, it's obvious you want to do a bike master plan, but I don't know what the earlier genesis of it was. Maybe um, there are members of the bike committee here who um, might know more because they were involved before I was. Yeah, that's a real limitation. Yeah, because we're talking about connecting rails by representing the region. I'm just thinking. So, um, it, it is a limitation of the Salem Master Plan because it is just Salem. So, we made a point to include um, people from the municipalities municipalities around us just to make sure that they're part of the conversation and um, you know tool was looking at uh, projects over the border in those municipalities that we know we want to connect to um, but where the plan um, has that deficiency we depend on um, uh, MAPC with their uh, it's the landline project where um, they're mapping regional trails that go beyond just one municipality so that's very valuable to us. Um, Essex County Green Belt, no, um, East Coast Greenway Alliance. It's another key organization that helps us coordinate our projects with other municipalities. And there's a huge advantage to um, regional projects that go beyond the uh, municipal boundary too because the, I can tell you the mass trails um, grant criteria that gives you extra points in the review if it's regional. And I think what was as mass bike, I mean, we do statewide, but we also do a lot of regional conversations. So um, we work with the MPOs, which think regionally, um, to try to knit projects together. There is a balance because a lot of these are municipally owned roads, so you're trying to get municipalities to agree. For instance, one example is between Chelsea and Everett. We're trying to get Beach and Street redone. Um, Everett will do it now because they have casino money. Chelsea's going to catch up next year. So not everything happens at the same time. It's the way the funding happens. It's the way it, there's the problem in Massachusetts is we have 351 municipalities, which means there's 351 different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And then there's the state, which has, as they like to say, 8% of the roads. Um, so we as Mass Mike kind of like to think of ourselves as the connector, which is kind of why we're all in this room together. I don't think there's a one answer of like, do we have an example of you know, regional uh, connection, except for what I'm thinking about in the Cape, because there's so many different bikeways, friends of groups that are now collaborating. Before they were siloed, but now we're kind of getting them all together and having round tables. And similarly on the Berkshires, you have the different municipalities to get the bikeway connection. Um, mainly it's friends of groups that are advocates that are working together that cajole then work with their local municipalities to get things yeah, up to that level. <laughs> Yeah, I see it from an advocate standpoint, like the, another example is the Minuteman Bikeway, it's the three municipalities that get together quarterly. 
but they don't, and they go back and then report to their own select boards and their own events. So I don't know of an example of municipalities being together. So well, there, there is an example that it doesn't go quite as far as you want to go, but the Coastal Trails Coalition, which is Newbury, Newburyport, Salisbury, and Amesbury, um, and they haven't done like a, a four community bike plan, but they have done trail connectivity and network planning right. across all four communities. Um, so it, it doesn't quite go as far as you want, but that's the best example I know of in, in the region. I feel like Pioneer Valley has one. Turnitin does the planning agency, but I think Pioneer Valley is a lot there. They might have a community, a multi-community bike plan. Something that Pioneer Valley is regional planning organizations did for them was the um, request for proposals for their regional bike share where they provide some kind of support for that. Um, we want our bike share to become a, a North Shore regional bike share. We're going to work with NAPC to do a collective procurement to uh, bring in the bike and other micro mobility operators um, that any of the North Shore communities can plug into. It's not exactly a bike plan, but it's just an example of the regional cooperation. Eric? Was there was one good example of a kind of regional planning on bikes here was in the Borough study for Route 1 and 7, uh, which was done not part of this, but a couple years before this. Uh, and I think led uh, this bike plan track. Um, Can you repeat that? Uh, actually, for the microphone. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch all that. Oh, sorry. So, for repeating, just about the, the Group 107 uh, corridor study, and uh, the, those corridor studies as being another good opportunity for uh, regional collaboration. Cool. I also said that the uh, Mass Trails grants uh, to have a uh, multiplier if there's a whole bit of uh, opportunities involved. And so, they can move up the can we hold off on questions because I do want to get to one more presentation before lunch and you can see that it's sitting there waiting for you um, is there anything like real pressing do I do one more just a quickie yeah. so our town would love to join an NAPC organization but we found out we have to pay five thousand dollars for each docking station where did you guys find the money for your docking stations uh, so Carl Alexander of Zagstra will be presenting tonight well, this afternoon, so he can tell you a lot more. But just the, the quick answer is um, local city money, sponsorship funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and some funding from Salem State University. Institutions in town. Yeah. <laughs> what municipality are you from? Marble. Oh. Um, well, we hope that Marble Hill will be part of the regional bike sharing network next year. Yeah, we have to build the docks. We the money. Cool, thank you, Tom. Thank Round of applause for Tom. <laughs> thank you so much for the work. Um, we have one more before a uh, quick break and lunch. Um, Hannah, who actually rode here from Somerville, props to that. That's all you gotta do. Um, I should have found it here. What's it called? The network call? I'm so good. Cool. So I first met Anna at a Massachusetts uh, advisory for a uh, Massachusetts Bicycle Pet Advisory Group meeting when we were discussing the bike and pet master plan. One of the things we're trying to figure out on the plan is measurements, metrics, goals, because they have all these initiatives which you kind of heard Michelle talk about earlier, uh, what we're looking at, but then the question is how do we make sure we're hitting those initiatives? Um, it's a really important conversation because we need to track our efficacy and to see if we need to make any changes. Now, obviously this is kind of a new thing for the DOT, so Anna's got a great role of kind of helping them figure out um, what they're doing is proper and not proper. And um, how was the bike ride today? Uh, variable. <laughs> <laughs> a, Parts were very nice. Very diplomatic way of putting it. Um, great, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Is everything working? I can also yell very loud. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Anna Gartzman. I work 
for the um, Bath Office of Performance Management and Innovation. And as a performance management office, we, yeah. Um, we are responsible for reporting out on all of the performance measurement that happens at NASA. Um, and then as part of that, we also do a lot of metric development. And that's a part of my role here is um, working with Jackie Wolf at um, MassDOT to kind of help figure out what exactly we want to measure um, from the vision that was identified in the pipeline. Um, and so what I want to talk to you guys about today is sort of what that process involves and where we are in it. Um, and where I would love your help. Um, and so the sort of basic problem we're trying to solve is how do we measure what is a good bike network? Once we've decided that we have a vision for what a bike, net bike network is, how do we actually put a number on it and say it is now three and we want it to be a four? How does that process happen? Um, it is an art, not a science, uh, as we will work through. Um, and How do you break the measure? How, and what we mean by that is sort of how do you 
Would there be a case where something good is happening in the world, but your measure actually says it's bad? Um, or the other way around, the measure is good, but what's actually happening is bad. I'll give an example, uh, safety. Um, whenever we measure sort of the uh, fatalities and serious injuries, as a number, we want to say, okay, we want that number to go down. We want to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. But if you measure just the number, which is a really simple measurement, what can happen easily is that if, as you increase the amount of cycling that happens, your number of injuries might go up, but your rate of injuries goes down, and so you can easily break this measure. Uh, so you want it to be a little bit more complex than just the number, and you might want to have an exposure risk like fatalities per miles or per hours or per something. Um, but it's also very, very easy to build a lot of complexity in and then have your measure be completely incomprehensible. So that's sort of uh, the way in which I tend to be biased, and so I would have to get myself back to a simpler life. Um, other trade offs include sort of the content integrity versus what data is available in bike walking worlds. There's not a lot of data, um, so there's always uh, the sort of bias towards using existing data because you don't want to wait for data to be collected, you don't want to put effort into collecting data, you don't want to validate things, um, and so you kind of focus on what is available, but that's not always what you want to measure. And so if you have a concept where you want to really measure that concept, sometimes you have to say, no, the current, the current data is not enough, and we have to collect more, and it might, it's worth the wait. But sometimes you want to say, okay, this is good enough, it's a good enough proxy, I'll live with it. Um, and then there's also time limits versus accuracy. So data is always improving. So the longer we wait, the better the measures can be. But it's a question of do we give something now that's not perfect and then work to fix it? Or do we wait until something is good? And so that's another sort of trade-off of deciding when is something good enough that it's worth discussing even if it's not perfect. Um, and so we kind of focused on putting out as much as we can right now and then continuously improving measures as more data and understanding becomes available. Um, the kind of drawback to that is that things change over time. Uh, and so that's a lot of additional explanation that you have to do as sort of more data becomes available and change the measures, then we're measuring something different than we used to. You have to explain the inefficiencies there. Um, so yeah, um, I want to walk, walk through an example of one of the measures that we're developing for the bicycle plant so you can see how this is going in action. Um, and then uh, all of the problems that are that we are solving. Um, so, so stage one is you set the vision of the goal. Um, so the vision in the bicycle plan is that biking in Massachusetts will be a safe, comfortable, and convenient option for everyday travel. Um, and so this sounds really simple, but there's a lot of decisions that happened as a result of that, and also from the vision we need to set the goal. And so who are we really talking about when we say this vision? What do we mean? And it's really about everybody, and that was a conscious decision um, based on the public input and sort of engagement that the vision applies to everybody. The option should be available to everybody who lives in Massachusetts, and so that's young people, old people, rich people, urban people, rural people, people with children, people who hate children, etc. Um, and including people who currently recycle and people who do not. And so the behavior we want to focus on this everyday travel is another concept where it's not <coughs> recreational trips. What we are focused on is biking as a transportation option for trips you already do. Um, and so it's about converting the existing mode into a set point. Um, and so when we combine these two concepts together, what we get is that although the easiest thing to do is to get somebody like me to make more of my trips on a bike, that's not actually what the vision is. The vision is to get everybody to do one trip on a bike, uh, and that's much harder. Um, and the focus is different, right? So I bike in here from Somerville, that, that is not, that is not going to be anyone's first trip on a bike. That is not the focus of what we're trying to do. Um, and so if we set the goal, we, it will mean this goal, increasing the percentage of everyday trips that are made by biking, would mean that we're successful in our, in our vision. If we see this number going up, then we are succeeding in what we want to see. So these are some of the decisions that were made at the goal level. Um, so let's talk about the second stage. How are we going to get there, the theory of change? Um, how will we switch a trip from a non-cycling mode to a cycling? Um, what will need to happen for that? Uh, so we think that if the cycling infrastructure is available throughout the state, it's comfortable.
comfortable enough to attract new writers and to serve destinations where people already go. Right? So this is the who, what, and the where. The who are the people who are currently traveling, the where is where are they actually traveling to and from. So because we're talking about existing trips. Um, and then the what is like how comfortable does something have to be, does infrastructure have to be for them to actually consider places like that as an option. Um, so kind of who will make that switch? What do we need to build? And where does it need to go to be convenient? Um, so the, the decision we have to make is what is comfortable? And this, um, hopefully I'll make sure I expect, uh, this is uh, a series of uh, screenshots I from Google Maps of my commute from my work to my home that I do on a regular basis. And it has, um, it's also very variable. So it has a section like this. This is on, um, that's fun, so start drive, uh, off-road, very nice. I'm never worried about this section. Uh, life is good when I'm on this. <laughs> um, then there's a section, this is Longfellow, so it's got those like, flex posts. I feel okay. It's not, there's also a uh, speed limit sort of kind of in place. Uh, most cars are going about 30 miles an hour. It's not horrible. I, I survived through this. Um, then there's a section of Longfellow where the flex posts stop and you kind of have to turn uh, out of this area and there's a lot of trucks. Um, so that's not awesome, but at least it's very green. It doesn't rise up there. So this is on the way down, but yes, there's definitely a way where it goes out on the other side and it's not, <coughs> it's not great. Uh, Do you dismount there? Hmm? Do you dismount your bike? Not here, but I will show you where it is. I might, I might do that. Yeah. And I think that's where the difference is at, right? So like, where are most people comfortable? Um, and I think, like, as we get more comfortable or, I guess, less concerned about our personal safety, um, we sort of bite more and more <laughs> unfortunate places. Um, like, for example, this is a very small street uh, where there's, I think there's like a share point is painted like up there somewhere, but this is one lane next to a series of parked cars uh, the door zone is this entire street, so there's no safety here. I don't feel great here. Um, and then there's this catastrophe. So <laughs> this is um, this green light that you see there. There's also a green for the cars coming that direction. So this is a four-lane road where I'm usually behind this red car, and I have to switch all the way over to the right. And take uh, so this is the point of my commute where I, on a daily basis, consider the life choices that I have made. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm this moment. <laughs> and do it anyway. But we can't expect everyone to do it. And I think that, so the decision we have to make as part of this planning effort is what is comfortable for you, writer? How do we convince somebody to start? Um, and so, where, yeah, so we're, sorry, not too fast, but basically the idea was that if we use the high comfort bike network as sort of this off-road or sort of like separated facilities, then that's what we consider as high comfort and that's where we see.